Alright everybody, welcome back to the Poor Pearls Almanac Season 3. Insert sound effects here. Who the fuck is that? Oh my god. No, actually, I don't like that one. Elliot, good. what the hell happened to your voice? What happened? Was it super deep? Did they do the deep, the deep <laughs> there, sound? There the deep it is. Echo that, sound effect? That, that velvety, lovely voice that I've missed so dearly. It's season three, baby. I've been drinking tea and doing my little uh, little uh, side muscles here, getting those good workout. There you go. Just rub them out. Rub them That's out, right. Elliot. That's Come right. On. I went to a, a public speaking class by Alex Jones. It was actually uh, it was pretty entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, I was. I was gonna try. I was gonna try to do an impression, but it was gonna be terrible. Yeah, I. I can't. I. I can't do it without laughing. Sorry. So yeah, season three. Excited to be back after taking. I mean, for you guys, it wasn't a break. It was a, a little break for us. We we do some recordings before the summer starts. Get some time to take a breather and start writing the next season's content. And we are back, and we are back in action, I guess you could say. Hell yeah. So what's that mean? It means we are here to talk about content. Now that we're getting a little bit bigger, I figured, you know what? It's a good time to, in the American tradition, find somebody to write episodes for us. So thanks, Matt. Yep, get someone to do the grunt work. Yeah, the intern is doing more interning to pay for his bills. (laughs) <laughs> to pay my interning bills. Yeah, pay your interning bills. Start paying those student loans. So true. Ah, so if you guys recognize that voice, you might from the hydrogen episode and the occasional commercial. If not, this is Matt, our newest... Well, he's been doing stuff in the background. Usually keeps me from getting canceled. Otherwise, generally just there as moral support. But he was really excited about the particular content we're covering today. So we are going to, or I am going to step back a little bit and just enjoy the view and hear Matt talk about some beautiful japanese history yeah andy tipped it off there a little bit but um if you haven't read the episode description so first of all if which you no one does just for the record no one yeah. ever reads them facts or the title you're gonna or be the, no one reads titles either they yeah. just click on stuff it's all on shuffle exactly we're talking about masanobu fukuoka and the wonderful work he did developing natural or do nothing farming Ellie's favorite. That's what I'm talking about. That yeah. literally is right up my alley. So I'm ready to dive into this. This sounds super interesting. So lay it on me. All right. He outlined these methods in a book that you may or may not have heard of called The One Straw Revolution. It was published in 1975 and was highly influential, not just in Japan, but the world over. The ideas he put forward have significantly influenced the organic agriculture movement. So who was he? A dude. It was just a dude. Just a dude. A dude being guy. Chilling on his dad's property. Yeah. It's like he thought he was in America and going for his MBA. I mean, was he always <laughs> was he always a farmer or like we're we're starting at the beginning, Andy, and we're not going back five thousand years, all right? No, not this one. Sorry, buddy. No there's no squirrels getting nuts in this one. So luckily we don't have to guess who he was. The like first part of the One Straw Revolution is like a bit of a autobiography. So 13,000 years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ah, well played. Ah, my, I, my heart skipped a beat and I literally felt like the pulse in my, right above I my actually, eyebrow. I actually saw the angina happen. Yeah. <laughs> a sheet oh, of sho- sweat my sho- just like, my sh- appeared on Elliot's forehead. Um, my, my shoulder hurts. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, okay. So we're starting back in 1913. Uh, And that's when Masanobu Fukuoka was born. He was the son of a citrus farmer and the town mayor. So he definitely, definitely, 100% sure did not kill Archduke Ferdinand is what you're saying. I mean, he was, no, he would have been like one at the time. Okay. Just confirming for, for reasons. We have no proof. We can't like rule it out specifically archduke you know? yes right. yes yes that's true there's a little more digging that needs to go on so in his early life he attended agricultural college and trained as microbiologist and agricultural scientist he was also a student of professor kurosawa this is a bit of a side note 
And I know it's not lost on me that we're like... Famously known as Professor Kurosawa. It's not lost on me that like we're like, what, five seconds into this? And already a side note, but um, Professor Kurosawa is like pretty well known in the plant science field uh, for being the first to extract the plant growth hormone gibberellin from a fungus that causes bacchanae disease in rice. Or you might have heard of it as like foolish seedling disease. So it was actually, like, as far as plant biologists go, pretty famous one. So he was, like, studying under a niche celebrity. Yeah. Like just, you. Right. Basically, you are going to be my Fukuoka, is what you're saying. Yeah, and uh, extract some uh, novel plant hormones first, and we'll talk. I did, metaphorically speaking, with a podcast. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. Sure. Did you Did you follow that? <laughs> I would love I would love to see a visual illustration of the mental gymnastics that Andy just did to get there. Yeah. I am very flexible is what I'm saying. Stuck the landing though. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Fukuoka like while he was in college and like immediately afterwards studied decay causing resin diseases in Japanese and American citrus trees, which is appropriate. And later worked as an agricultural customs inspector in the port of Yokohama. So this was in 1934 when he was 21 years old. During this time, he was working hard in the lab and having fun in Yokohama, but looked back on this period as a time of aimlessness and overwork. Eventually, this resulted in fainting spells and the contraction of acute pneumonia. He was like basically focusing on his like microscope so hard that he was like fainting up against it. So basically, he hated his job so much he tried to die, but like really slowly. <laughs> Just one fainting spell at a time. <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah. one of these times I'm going to smash my fucking head. It's going to be great. Less than five years, Andy's going to be in his underwear planting rice. Yeah. I have to say, as someone that used to have like 8 a.m. labs with like microscopes, a great way to sneak a nap was up with your eyes against the microscope. Just for anyone listening, <laughs> who's tired in the morning. Pro tip. And, you know, studying STEM. Fall asleep against a microscope. Anyway, pneumonia hit. Nailed it. Thank you. A good transition back. <laughs> this was a real turning point for Fukuoka, and he spent a lot of time alone in the hospital. He recalled he found himself face to face with the fear of death. He eventually recovered, but was deeply depressed, unable to sleep, unable to go back to work. I, get, I feel that. <laughs> yeah. Quite a bit relatable. They call that adulthood. <laughs> yeah. Here in, the, here, here in the West. In his own words, he was, quote, in agony of doubt about the nature of life and death. I'm going to read now from an excerpt from The One Straw Revolution. One night, as I wandered, I collapsed in exhaustion on a hill overlooking the harbor, finally dozing against the trunk of a large tree. I lay there, neither asleep nor awake, until dawn. I can still remember that it was the morning of the 15th of May. In a daze, I watched the harbor grow light, seeing the sunrise and yet somehow not seeing it. As the breeze blew up from below the bluff, the morning mist suddenly disappeared. Just at that moment, a night heron appeared, gave a sharp cry, and flew into the distance. I could hear the flapping of the wings. In an instant, all of my doubts and the gloomy mist of my confusion vanished. Everything I had held in firm conviction... Everything upon which I had ordinarily relied was swept away in the wind. I felt that I understood just one thing. Without my thinking about them, the words came from my mouth. In this world, there is nothing at all. I felt that I understood nothing. Yeah, that's metal. That's some metal shit, dude. I love it. It's dark and deep. So deep. So, yeah. We'll break it down because there's, there's, yeah. there's a whole lot to unpack there, I think. This is like a really nice passage about his revelation. And a few things should be noted. Larry Korn, who was a student of Fukuoka, who first translated the One Straw Revolution to English, has made some notes specifically about this passage. So the first that is that it was originally written in Japanese, of course, so direct translation does not always provide the full meaning of the text. The Japanese language contains a lot more subtlety when describing spiritual experiences and philosophical teachings. It's also more common in Eastern philosophers' teachings that some passages are not to be taken literally or figuratively, 
but as exercises to allow perception beyond intellect. In Japanese culture, herons are representative of the spiritual journey to enlightenment. In the context of this passage, to understand nothing is to recognize the insufficiency of intellectual knowledge. That just describes academia in a nutshell, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I think he... I think it's interesting because, and in I guess in the way that the language works, it's well. First of all, it's pretty poetic, but in that representation, he gets across his philosophy of him understanding his like depression and issues, sort of, and like gets it across in a way that like I don't know. I feel like there's a philosophy behind that where it's not quite nihilistic. Like he doesn't mean like nothing, like everything's pointless. He's just saying that, like, there's no way I could know enough about, like, everything or any one thing to, like, understand everything and, like, in totality. For sure, and he, like, develops that that exact thought, like, further, both, like, in his, like, practical agricultural methods, but also, like, more in his, like, personal philosophy that he, he like, taught to people. We see, and you'll describe it a little bit, is that humility that he's really describing is uh like really the framework for what the natural farming movement that he pushes forward really is framed within. Yeah. After this experience, Fukuoka resigned from his work and began wandering southern Japan. And he like stayed at a bunch of different places and he started just like asking people he met all these like super nihilistic questions. And he like recalls he was just like wandering around bumming people out. Yeah, so my previous statement was wrong. He's a total nihilist. <laughs> he's he's an emo kid, but like a hundred years too soon. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's that's awesome. I could see him doing the hair flip thing. It's all over his eyes, and he's all dirty. <laughs> oh, goddamn emo kids! I feel like that's a criticism of me. All right. Yeah, man, you did it. I'm not gonna not gonna tell him whose pants you were wearing. <laughs> they were my girlfriend's. Maybe I, you can't prove it. I couldn't tell. So, couldn't even tell. Well, uh, I think the photos will be up on the Patreon, right? Yeah, yeah, they'll definitely be there. Fortunately, I grew up in a time when digital photography was a weird thing, so... Not that I'm old, We have but... actual hard copy <laughs> photos, it's fucking weird. Yeah, yeah. They, they exist. They're in a, in a storage facility that may or may not be burning down in the next 24 hours. Perfect, perfect. So after this, he resigned from his work and began wandering southern Japan, eventually returning to his father's farm, where he aimed to live a very simple life growing citrus and grain. My conviction was, he writes, that crops grow themselves and should not have to be grown. If I could actually demonstrate my realization, the world would recognize its truth. Instead of offering a hundred explanations, would not practicing this philosophy be the best way? My method of do-nothing farming began with this thought. You know, I love Fukuoka for a number of reasons, but all I can hear when he says that is, my dad owns a dealership, <laughs> if you guys have watched Aqua Teen Hunger Force. So my dad, like, he owns this dealership, right? <laughs> yeah. So after returning to his father's dealership... Or... You can see the generational difference yeah, right there. I don't... Sorry, Matt. <laughs> Whoops. You'll have to fill me in later. Yeah. So he returned to his father's citrus farm and began living a, like a very simple life in a mountainside hut. Uh, he was entrusted with caring for the expansive family orchard. The orchard was carefully pruned year on year for proper spacing and for ease of harvest. And when the young Fukuoka left these trees to their natural course, which he thought would be best, the branches became intertwined and attacked by insects and the entire orchard withered. He found that applying his way of thinking all at once was not the right method. This is abandonment, he writes, not natural farming. Well, this is pretty classic here in the West. People move back home, like with, with their dads, usually in the basement, and then they'll start a project, like a band or something, and that's like a, a huge, complete failure. Instead, they just gave him an orchard, and he just let it go to shit, because that was him working, which was like the do-nothing method. It's actually pretty genius. I actually like this guy a lot now. <laughs> he realized that it's much more complicated than that, and that's okay. That's a part of growing up, I guess. Yeah, I think that's like that is something he had to learn. If I was his dad, and my son just came back and like fucked over my entire orchard, I'd be, I think, a little upset. Bro, bro, come on now, bro, bro. 
<laughs> it's natural, bro. It's all natural, man. Um, <laughs> Elliot's trying not to die laughing right now. I could just see him. I could just see him sitting there. So my dad owns this orchard, right? <laughs> and I told him you have to do it natural. He just didn't listen, and he doesn't understand. Now I have to go find my own orchard. I think his dad yells at him um, to cut his hair. That's like the most emo thing ever. Yeah, we're offending like a lot of very big Fukuoka advocates. Sorry, we will get to the part where he's good. Right now we're just teasing him. Fukuoka stands? The stands. Okay, so if the abandonment was wrong, and like that's not natural farming, what does he actually mean by do nothing farming? So this is one of those like imprecise translations that we talked about earlier. The methods that Fukuoka described don't take no work. In fact, they take quite a bit of work at harvest time, as pretty much all forms of agriculture do. The name is used to draw attention to the fact that these methods require considerably less work than other methods, especially compared to the more western and industrialized farming methods that were becoming more popular in Japan at the time and after the post-war land reforms. In his book, Fukuoka is quick to make this distinction. Yeah, so basically he's overselling, like, basically all YouTube people where it's like this one neat trick fixes all of your farming issues. And then it's like watering, like this totally obvious thing. So, so what you're telling me is this guy came up with a clickbait title to his farming method and got dumbasses like me to, it's a bait and switch is what it yeah. is. It's yeah. not do nothing. It's actually doing a bunch of stuff, but I'm just going to call it do nothing. Cause you're a lazy piece of, you know what? Go read your funny papers. Do you like having a garden? Yeah. Do you not like getting dirty? Yeah. Great. Neither do we. Introducing Do Nothing Landscaping. This sounds like just what I'm looking for. Can you take care of my pesky lawn? Of course. Our lawn care package includes not mowing your lawn and not pulling weeds. Do you seed and fertilize too? Nope. Spray Roundup? Absolutely not. So what do you do? Fuck all. We do absolutely nothing. Wow. I'm convinced. How do I get started? Pay us a $50 monthly subscription fee and we'll not mow your lawn, we'll not rake up leaves, and if you sign up today, you'll be enrolled in our super VIP privacy program. That means you'll never fucking see us ever again. So stop doing something and start doing nothing today. Welcome back. Matt, what the hell were you saying about basically manipulating people to listen to you and then making you money? Because they started showing up and listening to you? Yeah, I mean, that's the ultimate goal of all uh, farmers, right? And podcasts. Yeah, is to pretend you're producing and then instead get people to pay you to listen to what you have to say? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> all right, so to clear this all up, the aim of do-nothing farming is to farm as simply as possible within and in cooperation with the natural environment. Uh, this is in comparison to the modern approach of applying increasingly complex techniques to remake nature entirely for the benefit of human beings. This do-nothing method ends up making the work easier instead of harder and more complex. So, after this like initial failure with the orchard and facing pressure from his family, as well as in the context of an intensified war, Fukuoka took a job as the head researcher of disease and insect control at the Kochi Prefecture testing station. Before we go on, though, I do want to just, like, I feel like we need to just talk about the fact that this dude quit his job, went to go work on his dad's farm, and then was like, I guess I should go back to work. I guess I'll be the head researcher of disease and insect control. Like, it was no big deal. Today, our generation and yours, I guess, Matt, would have to basically dedicate two decades of their lives to get that same title. Yeah, he definitely... Um, Didn't we talk about at the beginning that this guy had pedigree, though? I mean, yeah. He definitely uh, fell back into a pretty nice wartime role. I'm not going to knock it. It sounds pretty sweet. I mean, I don't blame him, but like, also, let's just take a moment and appreciate the fact that this dude was like, yeah, so I sucked at growing citrus. I guess I'll go take this like very lucrative like respected job out of like spite yeah you did promise that you did promise the fukuoka stands that this was going to get better you're you're making it worse we're it getting is, there we gotta Come roast on. him a little bit first yeah this is america no one gets off i started to char on one side flip it <laughs> yeah better to work in a like disease and insect control station 
digging trenches on Okinawa. Pretty nice role. Fair trade off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he took this job and um, he worked to research increasing wartime food productivity. And there he pondered the relationship between scientific, that is like chemical agriculture, and natural agriculture. When the war ended, he returned to his home village. For the next 30 years, he lived only in his farming and in his own community, developing the do-nothing agricultural method. Did he retire in his 30s? Is that what you're telling me? He retired in his 30s? No. Not to rub it into Elliot. <laughs> Is that what you're telling me? He worked at a lab, passed out in a mic- microscope. Took a vacation. Got a sweet job, better job, and then retired at thir- like th- mid-30s. He's like, the war's over. I don't have to work. This guy has the life. I need to see a Netflix adaptation of this shit. Yeah. Right? He, he would be an Instagram influencer in 2022. He sounds balling. He just everything he does, it doesn't matter if it's awful. It's a step up. YouTube king right now. <laughs> F- failing up by doing nothing. Man, I bet there's like someone that saw that we were talking about Masanobu Fukuoka and got like really jazzed about it. You know, and now they're like, "Fuck these guys." Yeah, these they're like, "These guys suck." <laughs> right. So, like, one of the like most striking and maybe like recognizable parts of this method is that a lot of the planting is done with these things called seed balls, and this has been like sort of adapted. It's like pretty popular with gorilla gardeners too, and. You basically like take a bunch of clay and compost and seeds and you like mash them all together. You like homogenize them. You can just like take scoops of this and like roll it into balls with your hands. I think there was like a video where on his farm he used like a, uh, he like improved the efficiency of the process a little with like a screen and like some like hand tools. But a lot of the, planting is done like with these seed balls and with like a mix of seeds in them so wherever they fall one they're not gonna get like eaten by animals they're like already buried in some soil like what the like one of the most important things is what grows best in like a specific location whether it be like shady or dry or wet or whatever is going to be the thing that like does best in that clump of seeds and is going to like outcompete everything else all the other seeds in that ball so you end up having farm or, or a garden where things are like growing where they grow best this is yeah. getting this is getting better and better so masanobu in in his little farming community has sit, sat there and he has reinvented turrets like poop like animal poop. Like yeah, that, basically, like that. the idea that like an yeah. animal came through and ate the best the things that grew there. Yeah, and then like shat out the seeds. Yeah, so the idea He's is hand, basic hand making it. Yeah, so he takes basically like five parts, like a very like finely uh, sifted clay. So basically, like what an animal might eat is like dust that goes on the plant. Three parts, like a really finely sifted compost, and then like one part seed mix. And that seed mix isn't just like the wheat or rice that he might be trying to plant, but also like things that will keep animals away from from like nibbling on it. So mint, pepper, things like that. And then add some water to like make it nice and thick to get that nice poop con- texture, like Elliot likes to say. It's a turn. And then just basically yeet that all across the property. Yeah. Did I use the word yeet correctly, Matt? I'm sorry. I'm a holt. Yeah, that's fine. My, here's my AARP card. Like, you can confirm. You did fine. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, so, I'm actually kind of proud of you. That's basically the idea of, like, the seed balls. I'm, I'm hip. Not anymore. You blew it. I just got laughed at. It's fine. It's okay. I won't, be, I won't feel hurt by the fact that you guys laughed at me for using hip words. But yeah, so like you mix all this shit together, you basically roll some balls, like, you know, if you've ever played with mud in any time in your life, you just kind of like rotate in a clockwise motion in your hands and throw those in wherever you want the things to grow. And that that's it. I don't think you need to tell any of our listeners how to fling poo. Just saying. Yeah, we got a lot of apes listening. Are you poo flingers? <laughs> so beyond like seed balls, there's like kind of a... 
there's there's like more to this method than just like flinging these like seed turds about your farm. You say that. I do say that, and I'm gonna like back it up with the rest of the episode that I've written for this podcast. So, you know, you know, who's the host now, bitch? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't like this anymore. I'm in charge here. Cutting him off. All done. This episode is over. I'm gonna get kicked out of the Zoom in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a few central ideas of this method that culminate in the four principles of natural farming. And we'll get into those in a minute. One of the big ones is that we as humans don't and won't have the ability to fully understand the ecological complexity of nature. The only thing a person sees is the idea of nature arising in each of their minds. As soon as something is named, singled out, and studied individually, it's no longer nature. Only infants, he writes, can see true nature as they see without thinking, straight and clear. Yeah, so this guy's just waxing poetic and getting all philosophical, basically saying, like, too much ego in farming is not good. Like, you're overthinking too much. Yeah. Or, like, you know, you're doing too much, man. Do less. You know, I rescind my comment on the YouTube uh, star that he would have been in 2022. Not that attitude. <laughs> How are you going to sell classes telling people that they're doing too much? Just saying. Yeah. So he illustrates this like idea of ecology as like fundamentally like only like partially knowable with the story of researchers, former colleagues of his, coming to visit his farm. One was astounded at the lack of leaf hoppers, even though insecticide was never applied, and found that it was spiders keeping the population in check. Fukuoka pointed out that yes, this year it was primarily spiders that kept the leaf hopper population in check, but previous years it was frogs and other years toads. Not only that, but it was upwards of five different species of spider that worked in harmony, and are also consumed by frogs and toads. He writes of this experience, it's impossible for a specialized researcher to grasp the role of a single predator at a certain time within the intricacy of inter-insect relationships. Okay, so I'm starting to see where this guy was a scientist because he's got some pretty good powers of observation here and he puts that to work and comes up with like good reasons as to why things are the way they are or, you know, an explanation as to what he's seeing. I could see him being a pretty good lab guy. You know, looking into a microscope if he's not passing out. I'm just yeah. trying to, you know. Elliot just wants to lick toads. This is what no, it comes down to. No, I just don't want to see him as a snake oil salesman. Because in my head right now, that's all he is. He's hand making poo and failing his way to success. Are you just criticizing monkeys? Because it sounds kind of like you are. No, I'm not. No, hand making poop is definitely a, a human thing. Okay. That wasn't the part that I was worried about. But yeah, carry on. <laughs> so let's talk about those four principles of natural farming that I mentioned earlier. So the first is no cultivation. The earth, he argues, cultivates itself naturally by means of the penetration of plant roots and the activity of microorganisms, small animals, and earthworms. The second is no chemical fertilizer or prepared compost. This isn't to say that this method does not return nutrients to the soil, White clover ground cover fixes nitrogen, and thresh straw decomposes on the soil surface with the help of poultry manure. But this is not chemical fertilizer nor prepared compost. The next is no weeding by tillage or herbicides. Weeds help build soil fertility and help balance the biological community. Weeds should not be eliminated, he argues, but controlled with straw mulch, white clover ground cover interplanting, in temporary flooding. Lastly, and I think probably what I think most importantly, no dependence on chemicals. Uh, sturdy crops grown in a healthy environment requires no cultivation, fertilizing, or spraying. These methods only allow weak plants to be grown and developed. Yeah, I think that points to a couple of interesting points. Points. I'm going to say the word points more. While we think about productivity in terms of maximizing maximizing potential in the plants that we have alternatively what he argues here is that we shouldn't be trying to maximize potential from each plant but instead thinning to have plants that have more maximum potential 
And that might not be most obvious in the first or second generation, but over time, that will become more evident that we're building more resilient plants. Additionally, what I think is really interesting here is that when he presents natural farming, he doesn't really define it by what it is. He defines it by what it isn't, which I think is really hard for Western society to really wrap its head around because we we really want someone to come in and say, this is the way to do it. Here are the instructions for how to do it. And instead he says, this is the way not to do it. And everything else is game. And because of the way our academic system is set up and the way our society in general is set up, that's really difficult for us to kind of wrap our heads around. That was a stoner moment. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Total stoner moment. This is going in the real at the end of the season. And Elliot has nothing to say on that. No, I mean, I was, so I was going to say, uh, uh, again, this points back to that philosophical approach to, I don't think it was a philosophical approach to farming. I think it was a philosophical approach to life and you see it come up in the book and ideas that he wrote about farming. And speaking of doing nothing in farming, we have the commercial for you. Hey there, it's me, Crazy Norm, down at Normal Norm's Nut Emporium on John Brown Drive. We're going nuts for nuts in nutty November. We've got big nuts, small nuts, chestnuts, ground nuts, nut butter, buttery nuts, nut milk, milky nuts, nut cream, creamy nuts, and the for the late night crowd, chocolate covered CBD, deep fried nuts. Want to join the nut extravaganza? Nut up and join the nut posse. Join other members and get your sack of nuts pounded for free whenever you come in and make the creamiest nut milk you've ever had in your own kitchen. Crazy Norm's Nut Emporium, 420 John Brown Drive or online at fourproles.com. And we're back. Okay, so you might be thinking now, that's all fine. Like all these like agricultural methods, that sounds good. But I don't live in southern Japan. I'm not planning on living in southern Japan. I don't grow citrus or rice or winter grain. And especially not in this ecological context that's discussed in this book. Well, you wouldn't be alone in thinking this. Wendell Berry in the introduction writes, Knowledgeable readers will be aware that Mr. Fukuoka's techniques will not be directly applicable to most American farms, but it would be a mistake to assume that the practical passages of this book are worthless to us for that reason. They deserve our attention because they provide an excellent example of what can be done when land, climate, and crops are studied with fresh interest, clear eyes, and the right kind of concern. They are valuable to us because they are suggestive and inspiring. Like many in this country, and sooner than most, Mr. Fukuoka has understood that we cannot isolate one aspect of life from another. When we change the way we grow our food, we change our food, we change society, and we change our values. And so this book is about paying attention to relationships, to causes and effects, and it's about being responsible for what one knows. Holy shit, so this guy wrote the perfect intro for, like, our first episode, Complex Systems, and, like, what the podcast is about in the first place. So props on that, Masunoba. Good job, buddy. Yeah, I guess <laughs> this guy is starting to grow on me just a little bit. T total redemption, man. He's turning it around. Dude's like fucking Rudy over here. Okay, that was an old reference. I'm sorry, everyone. Yeah, that's dated. That's super dated, man. Matt can't even pretend to laugh at that, because he's like, what the you, fuck you is a Rudy? <laughs> He doesn't know what Rudy is. No, no. he has no idea. Sorry. Oh, on me. Yeah. Sorry, uh, guys. <laughs> Mighty Ducks? Is that better? Can yeah, I make no, a Mighty Ducks joke? I've heard of that. You've heard, oh, He's heard of it. He's never that, seen it. That that's, not, that's not much better, bud. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to stop Should we talking. move on? Yeah, let's yeah. move on. Yeah, okay. this is getting embarrassing. It's getting embarrassing, I guess. <laughs> I don't even I was, know what to I was say. Enjoy I was enjoying it. Listen, I made a Justin Bieber joke on this podcast once. I'm hip. <laughs> on this podcast? Oh, man. <laughs> not this, this episode, but not yeah. Not this episode. He's not hip. Nope. No. That was in a previous episode that he was hip. Go back and listen to it. Let's, um, can we add a tag to that episode? And it's just hip. hip. No, I think, I think so, we should make, I think we should make him listen to all of them. So no, yeah. don't tag it. Go back Don't. and find the episode where Andy was hip. There's just one. We got a ton yeah, of content. Have, have we got search. a ton of content. Yeah. The prize is that you've listened to all of our content because it's going to take you a minute. Yeah. Maybe like 87 hours. I mean, it's taken well, Andy is, a lifetime. It's taken Andy a lifetime. So this is what episode got him 120. 
So if our episodes were people, then uh, they would be almost the oldest person in the world. How old is the oldest person in the world? I don't uh, In the 110s, 120s, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. Google, tell me the answer to this. Google, what's my address? It's a trick question. Depends on what calendar they use. Oh, yeah, true. The internet says the oldest person alive is only 112 right now, which I feel like is kind of young. What are you smoking? I, not for like it, on the earth. I mean, for like the oldest person on the earth. Yeah, I feel like the world record is in it. Is like in the one twenties. Yeah, that's the oldest person alive. Let's see if the oldest person. I'm not ever gonna lie. That is. sounds horrible. I don't think I would ever want to live that long. No, oh no, absolutely not. 122 years, 164 days is the oldest person that's ever lived. 122 Gene Calment. Years. I knew it was in the one twenties. This is totally relevant to natural farming, by the way. She was a, an wait, avid we didn't advocate get, w- wait, of natural farming. We didn't even get to farming. the end of the episode. Let's no, finish we, it and then go to... The- no, we're talking about how she was the original... She only ate Fukuoka's food, so it's oh. very important. Relevant. Oh, okay. Science. Is that true? No, it's not. But okay. he did live pretty fucking long. Anyway, yeah, so let's let's talk about the rest of his life. So, um... I like that I just said that, and Matt was like, is that true? <laughs> No, you lie. Like I was just dropping ass. some knowledge on him. The power of podcasting. Yeah. Nothing gets fact-checked. It's dangerous, Andy. You gotta be, gotta be careful with that power of yours. For our listeners, this is the only fact-check that we go through. It's live fact-checking each other on the air. Yeah, making yeah, each other look like assholes. Also, <laughs> we're all full of shit, so... Also, all of you fact-check us we're frequently, all, please. First off, we're all full of seed balls. Yes. Handmade, <laughs> all-natural seed balls that I made Free myself. range I'm pretty free range, if you ask. Before we got totally fucking derailed, so we're talking about the when we change the way we grow our food, we change our food, we change society, we change our values. And this isn't really the first time we've discussed this sort of thing on this podcast, even. When we've talked about agroecology, we've discussed not only practical methods of raising food, but how these methods, to be truly sustainable also include a social and philosophical dimension, which are like just as important. To borrow again from the book, nature is grasped by scientific knowledge is nature which has been destroyed. It is a ghost possessing a skeleton, but no soul. Just as our perceptions of nature suffer from only understanding them from a single point of reference, our agricultural systems suffer if they're studied, developed, and optimized in isolation from their people, resources, and ecology. That doesn't sound like the world we live in. Our food is grown very locally and within context of where we live. Exactly. I say that as I, like, look out my window and see, like, several thousand acres of corn. <laughs> that's just for you, Matt. That's all That's Matt? all yours? Yeah, it's true. Andy, what's out your window? Oh. Uh, mostly crabgrass and some angry chickens that it's been in severe drought for three months yeah man, that's awful yeah super fun climate change is the best yeah hey it's gonna be the uh coolest summer for the next 20 years yeah and i think that points to like some of the uh important points around uh like natural farming is this idea of context and understanding where we exist today and not where we want to exist not disconnected from like a a larger system but like recognizing that there are challenges that we face today and we need to address those in a very local sense which i think has been like the main nexus of this entire podcast but like with climate change it's harder to not feel that way because everything is just i mean i i'm talking about right now we're recording in august before we release this but we're in severe drought here in new england and the predictions around climate change was that it would become wetter and warmer here and it's gotten warmer but it has not gotten wetter and if that's going to be the case the plans that we had in place for you know how to deal with that completely change if we try to direct it as we traditionally do in agriculture which means like here's how we we maximize productivity on this landscape based on like very specific measurements that don't consider externalities then there there's a very different plan for that versus what we're experiencing now and what what that projection is 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 not going to be very successful under the conditions we're experiencing right now and i think what he's suggesting is to basically throw out 
the rule book in terms of this is how you produce food in the space, but think about how do I merge the the natural systems to allow things like natural selection through um, not fertilizing and thinking about what would naturally grow and what would naturally be successful in those landscapes in a way that I guess is resilient to what we're experiencing right now, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think it's like one of the most important parts of it is not just that like the agricultural system is resilient, but like the like health of the people and the like lives of the people who are like producing the food, who are like doing this work is the like living dimension is also like much more sustainable than the agriculture that like is common and we like think about today. It's like a much healthier life and like relationship to the land and like the food you're producing. Yeah, it's much more mutual in uh, a really complex and nuanced way that because we're so disconnected today from it seems almost hard to grasp and in some ways almost overwhelming because that just seems like it, it carries so much weight that we're not used to carrying with our relationship to the landscape. Definitely, yeah. To wrap up a, a little on Fukuoka, so after he like published this method, he like wrote a few more books that went like deeper into other aspects of his like work and philosophy. And a lot of his like work later in life was focused on incorporating these like natural farming methods and systems in areas that are facing desertification, specifically in, uh, I think, Asia and Australia. Be wrong. That sounds about right. Definitely like in like, mainland asia he spent a lot of time in indonesia actually working with indigenous folks around this idea of how do we naturally farm this landscape in a way that's sustainable he as we hinted at earlier he uh lived to the ripe old age of 95 he died in 2008 and uh he by the time he died he was like pretty highly celebrated all over the world he like received several awards for his like lifetime of work including the uh ramon magsaysay award for public service and that's like generally considered like asia's Nobel prize he was a speaker at various earth councils and um climate change you know councils before his health declined he had a long life of like very dedicated work to natural farming in this system yeah, this guy has a lot of successes and failures, but they all culminate into a pretty impressive body of work. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he definitely pulls it out. What's that meme? They had me in the first half. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's Fukuoka. There we go. Wrapped it up nicely for the uh, yeah. Fukuoka Had me stand. in the first half. Brought to you by Hip Man. I was going to say, does that make him hip again? I kind of lost track. What's the What's the over-under? <laughs> The final I don't want to know. Verdict. What's the yeah. what's the plus minus? What are we doing here? Listen, I have like a plus twenty five handicap, so definitely knocked it out of the park on this one. <laughs> I guess he's hip. I guess he's hip today. So I'm so happy that we're back and we're recording cool episodes. And Fukuoka has a number of books. We basically kind of touched on just one, but I think it's the one that everyone's interested in and kind of frames up. When people talk about Fukuoka natural farming, this is what they're thinking of. So it was really important for us to to bring this up and to talk about why it's important and how that ties into like a lot of the other things we've talked about, whether it's agroecology or how it's his, we'll, we'll call it vision, was incorporated by permaculture. Uh, I, I think those ties are pretty clear to see. So I'm I'm happy to have finally covered this in our 120 odd episodes next week we'll be having an interview with someone who can talk a little bit more thoroughly on the subject hell yeah hell yeah yeah hey matt great episode thanks for uh, joining us and uh bringing in season three i'm ready for another great year let's do some stuff hell and, yeah and pump out that content yeah, yeah and if you enjoyed this episode and you're still listening after almost an hour 
please, if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, basically only those two, because I don't know of any others that have ratings, give us a review. It makes a huge difference when we're trying to convince people to come on and talk to us. And it also makes those same providers basically recommend us to people that are listening to stuff that's similar. So all those things helps get this really important and informational information you might say to uh edutainment new, new peoples yeah new peoples edutainment i like that yeah that's what we're here for if you enjoyed it please uh do all those things and subscribe to us on whatever service you're listening to us and follow us on instagram if you're one of those types of people or facebook or tiktok if you're the youth like matt not that i'm judging you matt Matthew. I don't have a TikTok. You don't have a TikTok and you're under 30. I'm Or is that like one of the things that people over 30 think under 30 people do? Yeah, well, that one. Oh. I've also like not downloaded it out of a little bit of spite. Okay. That makes me feel a little bit better. I just told myself I would never do it, but I'm on Instagram Reels, which might be worse. It's it's the old person version of TikTok. That's what I've been told <laughs> as an old person when I tell people that I see Instagram Reels. Anyways, so if you enjoyed this, please give us a review. Follow us wherever you follow stuff. Jump on Patreon if you want to give us a couple bucks for our time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Team. Hell yeah. Yeah, boy. Log off. Season three underway. Yeah. Three, three, part one. We average 62 episodes a season, so get ready. Get ready.